Well, good evening to the uh, chosen remnant, to those who have chosen rightly, shall we say. Uh, I guess there's something going on out there in the world, but the only thing I know is uh, they're, they're shooting down UFOs over Michigan, so I'm not really sure what that's all about. The world has uh, become a very strange place, I can assure you of that. Now, if, uh, if this is your first night here, let me uh, just very, very briefly uh, remind everyone of where we have been already. Uh, the first evening, we spoke about why we do what we do. Why are we even having a conversation like this? And we talked about the fundamental issue, which is really what we get to this evening. And that is the issue of peace with God. How can a person have peace with God? What is the gospel what is the mechanism of having peace with God? And that when you consider that central issue, there are a number of preceding issues that will determine how you answer that question. And so the first night we talked about authority. We talked about scripture. We talked about tradition. Uh, we talked a lot about church history. And I began by saying, as the pastor mentioned to you, um, if you're here just to, to get ammunition for debating on Facebook or something like that, that's, that's not what our purpose is. Uh, our purpose is to focus upon what is truly eternal and what is truly important in eternity itself. And that is how someone can have peace with God. And so last evening, we looked at some of the issues that can stand in the way of someone being able to listen clearly to that message, uh, emotional attachments in regards to the papacy and last evening, we spent a fair amount of time looking at the subject of Mary and the various Marian dogmas and how they developed over time and uh, how especially, for example, like the bodily assumption, utterly unknown in the early church, um, and how this illustrates the fact that the claim that what you have within Roman Catholicism is uh, sacred tradition with the oral, the oral tradition and the written tradition, the magisterium of the church, apostolic succession, all of these things, all these claims, when you examine what has been defined dogmatically, especially over just the past uh, 200 years, you see that what has been defined uh, has no connection whatsoever to the apostolic church. Uh, so we talked about a lot of things, but in all of it, we were moving toward this evening because the issue is what the gospel is and how you define it and how you have peace with God. And so once again, recognizing that in Roman Catholicism today, you have a massively wide spectrum of, of expression that you will find extremely uh, historically uh, Orthodox congregations, and then you'll go to Boston College and get everything, <laughs> everything under the sun. And when someone says, well, it's not fair to point to places like that, say, well, you know what? Uh, when y'all take it seriously and start excommunicating those folks who blatantly reject the historic teachings of your own church, then we can have a conversation about that. But the reality is the current Pope is putting a lot of those people in the College of Cardinals. Uh, who very plainly do not hold to what almost any of his predecessors held to in regards to uh, specific theology. And so it's a strange day because, when I, as I've mentioned before, when I first started dealing with Roman Catholicism, dealing with Catholic answers, doing debates with uh, Patrick Madrid and Jerry Matatix and uh, Jimmy Aiken and, and Tim Staples, et cetera, et cetera, there was a consistency because John Paul II had been Pope for a long time. And so there was a level of consistency in what could be said. Um, the problem now is it's just too easy for anyone to compare John Paul II with Francis or with Benedict XVI, for that matter, um, and recognize the massive differences that exist there. And so a lot of people have, have, are struggling with that, and that's, that's an appropriate thing to be struggling with. So when I talk about what... Rome teaches today, I'm going to be going back to Universal Catholic Catechism interpreted in light of the Vatican Councils and all the way back to Trent and things like that, um, not the South American liberation theology bent 
that is the current perspective of the current uh, pope. And because that's mostly what you're going to be encountering uh, in, with your families and, and people who live in this area. And so when we talk about the gospel itself, uh, you will find many Roman Catholics that are confused about certain issues because they've heard lots of different things from different people they've gone to. But we need to, we need to define some terms, talk about some issues, and then I want to focus in upon what everyone would agree is the central aspect of Roman Catholic worship, and that is the Eucharistic sacrifice, because this is the issue. If you have a finished work of Christ that is the basis upon which the Father in justice can impute the righteousness of Christ to a believing sinner who approaches him with the empty hand of faith, that's completely different than if you have a situation where you have a propitiatory sacrifice that is repeated over and over and over again, but perfects no one. That will change everything. So most of the debates we have on justification, things like that, sure, we cover important stuff. But the reality is the New Testament message is focused upon what is accomplished by Christ and his ability to save because of the perfection of his once for all work. And if you change that, if you evolve that over the centuries into something that's different, it's going to impact everything. And so we need to, we need to once, I, let me remind you of the story that I told earlier in regards to the subject of peace. Remember, I told you the story of my debate, 1991, I think, with Father Mitchell Pacwa and the discussion of justification and the issue of how you have peace with God. And you'll remember that what the focus of that was is if you can commit, now remember in Roman Catholicism, you have venial sins and mortal sins, at least again, in historic Orthodox Roman Catholicism. I realize there's lots of people today that have sort of moved away from those clear definitions, but a venial sin does not destroy the grace of justification. So in a normal situation, you'll be baptized as an infant. That baptism sacramentally infuses you with grace. You're placed into the state of grace. You are made pleasing before God. And when you commit a venial sin, the state of grace is not destroyed. You don't become the enemy of God when you commit the venial sin. But there is temporal punishment for that sin that clings to your soul. And so there's, there's mechanisms through sacramental forgiveness, confession, uh, for the removal of uh, that, that punishment. Um, and if you die with said types of temporal punishments upon your soul, that's what purgatory is about. Purgatory is not a second chance salvation system. You have to die. Again, I'm talking about as it was defined long ago, uh, I've talked to so many Roman Catholics don't believe any of this stuff anymore that I have to keep saying that. I apologize, but that's, that's the reality. Um, but again, the, 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 when I've debated purgatory with Roman Catholic apologists, at least they have been orthodox in their understanding of it. And so uh, it's not a second chance salvation system. It's not, uh, I was lost, but I get to go to purgatory. And now I get to go to heaven, something like that. No, you have to die in a state of grace. Uh, purgatory is a place of cleansing. And in fact, if you want to hear, um, uh, there's been a couple, there's been two really helpful debates on this. And I've, a bunch of you have come back the next night, I'm not going to be able to do that tomorrow night. We're not going to be here. <laughs> um, and have said, you did look up these debates. Uh, look up on YouTube, my debate with Father Peter Stravinskis on purgatory. Because honestly, uh, we got more into what justification actually is than in some of the debates I've done on justification. Uh, very, very useful, especially the cross-examination in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look that up. It was um, fascinating. Uh, but then Tim Staples was on my uh, webcast a number of years ago, and we did a uh, discussion of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as well. And I think you'll find both of those to be very helpful and dealing with that. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on 
on purgatory this evening, other than to just say this in passing. Purgatory develops over the centuries. Uh, you can find some elements of it as early as Augustine and a little bit before that, something called refrigerium. Um, but it really comes together uh, and, and becomes dogmatically defined, especially as, as Rome is um, fighting against Eastern Orthodoxy on certain issues and uh, becomes dogmatic at that particular point in time. And then that becomes the, the basis for the concept of indulgences, the thesaurus meritorum, the, th the treasury of merit, uh, and all the things that that eventually led to in regards to the Reformation uh, comes from that. And what you need to understand, and this is very, very important, this is going to, this is going to sort of fit in later when we talk about the cross and the, the one time, the once for allness of the sacrifice of Christ. Within that concept of purgatory and indulgences is something called satis passio. Satis passio. You got to get used to Latin if you're going to talk about historical Roman Catholic theology. Satis passio, the suffering of atonement. And the soul undergoes satis passio. Now, an indulgence is a, uh, a transfer of merit. The treasury of merit is made up of the excess merits of Christ, Mary, and the saints. So it's a mixed merit. It's not just the merits of Christ. The, the teaching back at the time of the development of indulgences was that Christ could have dropped, could have shed just one drop of blood and redeemed the world. But since he bled copiously, there is this excess merit that becomes available. And Mary, of course, being sinless, all sorts of excess merit. Now think about it. what that means is if you have an indulgence applied to you, then you are having merit applied to you that is to, that is to remove temporal punishment of sin but it's a mixed merit. It's not just the merit of Jesus Christ. It's of Mary and of the saints as well. And so when you, in the final state, stand before God, it's not a seamless robe that is merely the righteousness of Christ. It is a robe made up of the righteousness of others as well. But that's just an indulgence. Satis passio is the suffering that you undergo in purgatory to remove the temporal punishments of sins upon your soul. It's your suffering. And so if you go through purgatorial fire and you enter into the presence of God, you enter into the presence of God with a robe made up of the righteousness of Christ, Mary, the saints, and your own suffering. Satis passio. Now I've talked to many Roman Catholic, never even heard of it, but it's there. You can look it up. As I said, there are more sections on indulgences in the Universal Catholic Catechism than on justification. Look it up. It's there. It's, it's not something that's been buried under a rock someplace. It is very clearly to be found there. So those were all major issues in the Reformation because most Roman Catholics today will admit there needed to be Reformation because it had become a crass selling of God's grace, and it had. Just read Tetzel's works and you'll, you'll see exactly how that ended up working out. So putting that aside for just a moment, venial sin, you commit a venial sin, you do not become the enemy of God. The grace of justification is not lost. You commit a mortal sin and a mortal sin destroys the grace of justification. And you become the enemy of God. So you're justified, you cease being justified. You can be re-justified through the sacramental system. And what that means is you can be justified and unjustified and justified and unjustified many times. But the idea is that you have this distinction of sin. Now, exactly which sins are which is a long story. And many, many people have struggled with the fact that you can go to one priest and have one thing identified as a venial sin. And another priest down the road will identify it as a mortal sin. Well, that makes a huge difference because that's going to really impact your peace with God. Am I now right with God? Some of you may have heard the story. And by the way, we cannot absolutely affirm and prove that Luther was the one who came up with this. But given Luther's earthiness, I think it probably did come from him. But you've, you've probably heard a discussion of the illustration that L Luther used 
of the dung pile, the dung hill. Hey, uh, Germany in the 16th century was very rural. It's still very rural in many places for that matter. And you couldn't go down to the feed store and buy a bunch of nitrogen. Well, you're not going to be able to do that for much longer anyways. Um, uh, if the WEF and WHO keeps doing what they're doing, but they just want to starve us to death. But we won't talk about that this evening. Um, you had to uh, use your farm animals to help fertilize your fields. And so I'm sure it was not a pleasant task, uh, but you would create a pile of what your cows and pigs and so on and so forth left behind for you. And it would not be a pleasant thing, not be a pleasant thing at all. In fact, it attracts flies. And when the winds go in the wrong direction, it can ruin a really good meal too. So everybody knew about dung piles, but what is said to have been Luther's illustration was he said that the righteousness, that we are the dung pile. We are offensive to God. We are sinful. And a holy God cannot have that which is in rebellion against him and against his holiness in his presence. So this is the division that takes place. And he said, the righteousness of Christ is like the first snowfall of the winter season. And this doesn't work quite as well down here. And I guarantee you it doesn't work at all in Phoenix because <laughs> we don't know what this is, but I was born in Minneapolis and we, we got snow in Minneapolis. We really, really do. And if you've ever lived in a place, um, the first snowfall of the season is so beautiful. You get up that first morning and there aren't any tracks uh, nothing's been plowed. There's no yellow snow or brown snow or black snow or anything like that. It's just this beautiful, soft, smooth, perfect blanket of white. And obviously, when it covers over that dung pile, the smell is gone. The flies are gone. The offensiveness of it is gone. However, if you go running at it hard enough and dive in, you're still going to be in a lot of trouble. And the point of the illustration was, and this is very important for you to, to, to grasp. One of the key differences between a biblical Pauline understanding of justification and sanctification. The biblical teaching is justification is a forensic act of God's part. It is God as judge making a declaration. This person is right with me. This, he is acting as judge and the judge is saying, you in relationship to this court, the divine court of justice, are right in my presence. Now he does that based upon what? The righteousness of Christ being in him sanctification is directly connected, but it must be distinguished because Paul distinguishes it. It must be distinguished because in Roman Catholicism, justification and sanctification have become confused. So that in the Roman Catholic system, in the sacram sacrament of baptism, and then in, in, uh, other sacramental mechanisms once you've committed a mortal sin, you have an infusion of grace that changes the soul and makes it objectively pleasing before God. And that's why you go to heaven is because you're objectively pleasing to God. And so Roman Catholics will look at Luther's illustration and go, Oh, it's just a bunch of legal. That's just a legal fiction. That's a, that's ridiculous. You're, you're saying that you're still a pile of dung. Yes, and then you're going to be sanctified and changed. All he's doing is illustrating the difference between the imputed righteousness of Christ and then the work of the Spirit of God within us to conform us to the image of Christ more and more throughout our lives. You have to make the distinction. Most of the time, unfortunately, when that conversation takes place in debates and things like that, there's not a lot of time to actually develop it. But a number of years ago, I... I said, you know, let's, let's reverse this uh, and let's look at it from the Roman Catholic perspective. When you're baptized, 
you're changed into a pile of gold. The infusion of that grace makes you a pile of gold. You are objectively pleasing to God. Your soul is objectively pleasing to God. And God likes gold. Evidently, he's got so much of it, he paves this, the streets with it up there. So um, you're going to get to go to heaven because your soul is objectively pleasing to God. Until you commit a venial sin. Well, what happens if you commit a venial sin? Well, you have temporal punishments. What are temporal punishments? Well, flecks of dung start to appear on the surface of the gold. And you can cleanse them off through penances in this life. But if it's still there, God's not going to take a pile of gold because you're still a pile of gold because of the infusion of the grace and you haven't, you haven't lost that. You haven't committed a mortal sin. You can't, you can't have a, a pile of gold with dung on it in heaven. And so there needs to be a way of cleansing it. And that's what purgatory is. But here's the real difficult part. What if you commit a mortal sin? Pile of dung. Pile of dung. You're back. You're going to need a new infusion of grace. And here's the problem. Rome will actually teach people that it is the sin of presumption to think that you know which one you are. In fact, Ludwig Ott in the book Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma said, quoting off the top of my head here and I'm getting older, but the reason for the uncertainty of the state of grace lies in just this, that no one can know with certainty if they have fulfilled all the conditions which are necessary for achieving justification. Keep that in mind. You can't know whether you have fulfilled all the conditions necessary for achieving justification. Can I give you a little bit of a hint of what's coming? Jesus did that for us. And that's one of the central differences between us. Okay. So mortal sin, venial sin, temporal punishments, punishments after death. What does all this have to, well, obviously the concept of infant baptism, uh, removing the stain of original sin, placing you in a state of, of grace, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all these things develop over time. All you've got to do is go back, uh, read the earliest of the, of the church fathers. You read, read Tertullian, for example, writing on baptism and all the different views that were present in that day uh, and how infant baptism actually developed. And it was, didn't have anything to do with that. It, it, it had to do with the fact of the matter, really, until modern times, infant mortality was a constant in the human experience constant even in the days of the reformers most women would have to give birth to 10 live children to get one of them through to adulthood almost every one of the reformers lost a child luther did calvin did it was just simply what life was about and so way back in the early centuries uh, there were a lot of people that put baptism off until right before death and then there were others that went, it sort of split for a while, went two, two different directions. And then others are like, well, my child looks like they're going to die. So I want them to be baptized now. Uh, these things developed over time. And, and in, like I said last evening, as we talked about church history, unevenly in different places at different times, so on and so forth, uh, you have this type of development in regards to the concept of baptism and the effect that it has. But, Let's now get to the real key issue. The fundamental difference that we have, unfortunately, is not normally what most evangelicals focus upon in speaking with Roman Catholics. I'll just be honest with you. Um, most evangelicals focus upon Things that they see that are different, practices, clothing, things like this. And they'll focus upon the difference between faith alone and faith plus works. But without seeing that there's something even deeper. There's more something more foundational. And so let me throw this out at our side. Okay. 
we live in a day and we have for a long time where most of our theology regarding the cross is far more based on emotion than it is scripture. I was raised as an independent fundamentalist Baptist and my parents had a, a record album. You younger folks, that's a piece of vinyl. It's about yay big. You put it on a table and it spins around. You put a needle on it. It's really, really interesting. It's really cool. It's having a comeback. I'm noticing my, my daughter's getting records and stuff like that. And even though the first time I tried to describe that to her, she looked, she read the word and read it as vinyl. Uh, didn't know what vinyl was. Um, she's going to kill me for saying that. But anyway, uh, we, my parents had a record of Tennessee Ernie Ford singing hymns. Anybody? You, you, Michelle, no, you, you, okay, yeah, see, Tennessee. Man, that, <clears throat> those low bass notes, I can still hear it to this day. And the, one of the songs on there was The Old Rugged Cross. That's beautiful, I love it. But unfortunately, in a lot of our churches, we never get past that level of theology to really think about what the cross really was. We've, we've seen it, we've got it, you know, you've got a cross on your staple and the uh, pastor's laughing, but he's probably he's going to hate me forever. But um, we, we, we use it as a symbol and these days, uh, I, I'm not sure how much longer it's going to be before it's going to become a illegal thing. It's one of the reasons I wear one is like, yeah, go ahead, try. Um, but we have such an emotional connection to it that much of what the new Testament teaches about it is not a part of our thinking. I think one of the problems with this is the book that has the longest sustained discussion of the atonement and its purposes and the relationship of father, son, and spirit. And that is the book of Hebrews. Unfortunately in our day, given the book of Hebrews requires a real knowledge of the old Testament. I mean, see how much the old Testament is being quoted in the text, the book of Hebrews. It's not a favorite book. I preached 85 sermons out of Hebrews when I went through it a number of years ago, and it became one of my favorite books in the process. And I'd highly recommend it to you along those lines. But I think that's one of the reasons. We have very much a hymn-based view of the cross and not a Bible-based view of the cross. Because see if this sounds strange to you. When you look at the cross... If you do not see the wrath of God, you will never fully understand the depth of the love of God that is displayed in the cross. I think one of the reasons that that's really become uh, even more important for me, and you can look this debate up too, is all the work that I've done with Muslims around the world. And their complete, you know, their rejection of the cross, Surah 4, 135, there was no, you know, that wasn't Jesus. He was taken up and the substitution theory and all the rest of the stuff that they have denying the, the crucifixion. But um, I've stood in mosques in South Africa. You're all sitting on nice, comfortable chairs. We're a bunch of wimps. The Muslims sit on the ground, sit on the carpet. And they were no farther away than right there and had the opportunity to present the gospel of Christ and the reality that in and of myself, I have nothing to attract the grace of God. The looks on their faces, they had never heard anything like that. But they believe that Allah can simply forgive any sin without atonement. His law can be broken and Allah can just simply say, forgiven. And my point and my argument, if you want to look it up, it was uh, 2013, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq Mosque in Erasmia, South Africa. I was debating, um, uh, oh, good grief. Man, I've debated uh, Shabir Ali uh, many, many times. Um, Yusuf Ismail was there too. Uh, and this topic was how we do have peace with God. And so I was focusing in on the fact that in Islam, the connection between God's absolute holiness and his forgiveness has been broken. His law can be, remain broken. 
because there's no atonement. There's no atonement in, in Islam. And that was a message they had never heard that the only way I can stand before God is if I have the righteousness of another. And that is mine by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the same issue we're dealing with here. Because for Rome, you have grace infused, but there is a denial of the imputation of the righteousness of Christ as your sole basis before God. And where does that righteousness come from? It comes from substitutionary atonement. Man, there's something that people hate. Uh, some of you said, told me tonight, you listened to the debate that I did Wednesday night. I've been speaking a lot this week, haven't I? Um, did the debate with the progressivist on what is marriage. And I, this didn't come up in the debate, but he has written an entire book against penal substitutionary atonement. He thinks it's terrible. It's child abuse. And that's the terminology that's being used this, these days. When If you believe what you were singing in the hymns beforehand, you're in a minority today. You may think that you're in the majority, but you're actually in a minority today. Um, you, you go to seminary and you'll discover all sorts of theories of atonement and you study church history and it's perfectly fine. Yeah, you need to, Irenaeus had the recapitulation theory and you've got Anselm and Abelard and you've got all this stuff going on. Fine, uh, teach church history, that's, that's good. But what does God say in his word? That's the issue. Even a text like the, the great exchange text, 2 Corinthians, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Even a text that clear. There are well-known people today that see that in a completely different perspective. N.T. Wright, brilliant guy. But N.T. Wright sees that as only relevant to the apostles. Do you know that? He made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, the apostles, so that we, the apostles, might display the righteousness of God. Totally different idea. Totally different concept. So there's a, like I said, the, one of the most dangerous places you ever go is a Christian bookstore. <laughs> you know, walking down the aisles of a Christian bookstore, you think you're in a good, safe place, but you should, you should always figure there are pythons coiled up on every shelf just waiting to suck your spiritual life right out of you. And you'll discover that there's... There's been a lot of confusion down through the years. Didn't need to be. But when you subjugate scripture to external tradition, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So what does Rome teach about the Eucharistic sacrifice? That knows I'm using the term the Eucharistic sacrifice. First of all, the term Eucharist is a beautiful term. We have unfortunately allowed it to be stolen from us. It's the Greek term Eucharisteo, Eucharistia. Uh, it's Thanksgiving. It's giving of thanks. And if you want proof of this, you can go online and you'll find many sermons that I've delivered in my own church on the subject of the Lord's Supper, its importance. Uh, we, we have the Lord's Supper every Sunday at our church. You don't have to do that. I'm just simply saying we do. Uh, we think it's that important. In fact, to be honest with you, in 2020, that's why we never closed down. We were one of the very few churches in Phoenix that wouldn't do it. And one of the reasons was we celebrate the Lord's Supper and our people expect that and we're going to keep doing it. And we did. Um, we have very, a very high view of what takes place in the supper. And in fact, if you've ever read the London Baptist Confession of Faith, we are a confessional church. And so we have London Baptist Confession of Faith. Read the section on the Lord's Supper. You'll go, whoa, really? Yeah. Um, it's quite interesting, quite, quite full. And can only be understood against the backdrop of Roman Catholicism, to be perfectly honest with you. Because there are specific sections that say, we deny this, we deny this. Because those were the things that were defined dogmatically by Trent and other uh, councils. What happens in the Lord's Supper? 
Well, this is where, and this, this is a subject I have not been able to really dive into as much as I wanted to, but I remember last night I read you the quote from O'Brien on the power, the sacramental power, the sacerdotal power of the priest, rendering Christ as the victim upon the altar. Remember, I read that last evening. If you weren't here, you can go back and listen to the tapes. The current idea, now this is, again, if we had more time, we can go back into history and demonstrate that, for example, the, the very metaphysical categories that are necessary for understanding what's called the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is the dogmatic teaching from the Fourth Lateran Council onway, onward uh, up to the modern period, still very much believed by many today, um, but by many others, not nearly as much, especially in academia. The whole metaphysical context there comes from what's called accidents and, and substance, Aristotle, Aristotelian metaphysics, which I am not going to even touch on here. But Aristotle's metaphysics becomes intimately woven into Orthodox Roman Catholic theology through the influence of, of course, Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas is dealing with a lot of issues in his day. He's a Dominican, there's heresies, he's dealing with Islam, uh, all that kind of stuff. And he utilizes these metaphysical categories to come up with what now today is known as the doctrine of transubstantiation. I submit to you that none of the apostles had a clue. And hence, to try to force their words into a Aristotelian metaphysical category is to inevitably twist what they had to say. To minimally engage in eisegesis, the reading into the text of something that the original author could never have even conceived of. But the idea is that through the power of ordination, the priest's soul is literally marked with a special ability as, and in their ordination, they are called an altar Christus, as the representative of Christ to render Christ present, body, soul, blood, and divinity in the bread and the wine. And this results in now, and, and by the way, uh, go listen to the debate I did with Mitch Paco on this and, and his primary argument was to say that on the night of Jesus' betrayal, when he said, do this in remembrance of me, do this as in the imperative form in the Greek language. And therefore, Jesus was literally ordaining the apostles as priests right then and giving them the capacity to work the miracle of transubstantiation. And that in fact, at the last supper, he did that because he said, this is my body. So this is my body, but that was before the crucifixion. Go listen to it for yourself. But the point is that Christ is Christ's one sacrifice. Rome says Christ died in a bloody manner only once. They do say that. However, that one bloody sacrifice is represented, not represented, because represented in, my, in our minds is like the, the bread and the wine represent something else. No, represented. So put a dash in there. In an unbloody fashion upon the altar. It is the same sacrifice of Christ, but in an unbloody fashion because he is literally made present through the miracle of transubstantiation upon the altar. That's why a number of you are former Roman Catholics and you all probably remember, <laughs> you probably remember the first time you walked into a non-Catholic church and you started looking for the holy water and wondered why nobody else was genuflecting because you were just used to doing that, right? Now, why do you do that? Well, those, if you weren't raised as a Roman Catholic, that's because there is a consecrated host in the tabernacle, monstrance, whatever terminology you want to use in a particular church, 
and hence God is physically present in the church. And so you are bowing in light of the presence of God physically amongst the people. And so transubstantiation is believed to render. Now, again, it looks like, looks like bread, uh, but that's where the Aristotelian categories come in and you have accidents and you have substance and the accidents can strike the eye in one way, but the substance has been changed so that God is physically present. And so that you have the one, the one sacrifice of Christ being represented in an unbloody fashion. Now, what does that mean? Now, z- zero in, hear me here. Cause this is, this is where we, where the rubber meets the road. What that means is as a Roman Catholic, you can come to the cross to the Eucharistic sacrifice over and over and over and over again. Think about if if you're raised within the church and you live to be a ripe old 80 and you're a good Roman Catholic, you go to mass three times a week. How many masses is that? A lot. Tens of thousands of them. And you're not perfected by it. It doesn't perfect. You can commit a mortal sin and still lose the grace of justification. You can commit venial sins and you've got the temporal punishments upon your soul. You're not perfected by that sacrifice of Christ. You receive grace. It is a means of grace. And the, the, the better your uh, the attitude of your approach of your heart to God, your intentions before God, the more you get. I mean, if you come in and you don't care, you're thinking about something else, you're actually thinking about how you're going to go and sin that night or something like that. You know, obviously, you know, Romans say you're, you're got all that wrong. But the fact is that sacrifice that is being represented before you does not perfect you. It's vitally important, absolutely necessary. Remember, the issue of the Reformation was not the necessity of grace. Do you hear me? The issue of the Reformation was not the necessity of grace. It was the sufficiency of grace. Rome teaches that grace is absolutely necessary. Never, never miss that. Absolutely necessary. We believe it's absolutely sufficient. You don't have to add to that your sacramental obediences. That, as I mentioned last night, what did Luther say? In writing to Erasmus, a Roman Catholic priest, you have touched your finger upon the hinge upon which it all turns. And what was that? The will. Honor the will, freedom of the will. That was what was going on then. It's what's going on in the te- pages of the New Testament from the beginning and with us today as well. So you have a Eucharistic sacrifice. It is an actual sacrifice taking place, but it is a representation in an unbloody fashion of the one sacrifice of the cross that was a bloody sacrifice. And it is accomplished through the power of the sacerdotal priesthood. And this is the central act of worship within Roman Catholicism. Everything else is ancillary to it. Therefore, that should be very much the focus of our presentation, discussion, response to that. But like I said, since we very rarely have a deep theology being preached today that connects the purposes of God, the decree of God, the harmony of Father, Son, and Spirit in the sacrifice of Christ, and the perfection that comes from that sacrifice, 
so that the perfect righteousness of Christ can then be imputed to all those who die with Christ. So that his death becomes their death. His resurrection, their resurrection, union with Christ. Since we don't focus upon that, since we don't spend the time to look at what Hebrews talks about when it talks about Christ as our high priest and what the high priest did. We don't normally focus upon what is most important. And I don't want that to be the case for us. I want us to focus upon what is most important. Let me give you a couple examples. Turn your Bibles, please. It's, I, I know I've not had a lot of time to be doing that, but there's a couple things we really, really, really need to look at. And I know time is short, but, well, I don't know time short for you, but um, I, want you, I want to emphasize a couple things here. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. And again, this is where our many Protestants have a problem with the canon. What I mean by that is if we're really honest, the red letters are the most inspired, followed by the New Testament as a whole. And then the Old Testament is really good for flannel graph and entertaining the kids, but yeah. It's not really Theonustos. It's not really God breathed, but it is. And because we have a functional Deutero canon with the 39 books of the Old Testament, we sort of get lost in Hebrews because the writer expects us to understand it and he uses it that way. And so he starts talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek. And we're like, Melka who? <laughs> I didn't get that far that one year I tried to get through the Bible. Um, and I only made it to about the third week of January. Um, it is actually only the second week of February. Anybody else failed this year? Uh, I'm not going to ask for any hands on there. We'll have an altar call later on. Um, but you, you can see the citations uh, in, in the text. And you have the Lord swearing, you are a priest forever in uh, verse uh, 21. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And so you have covenant theology and you've got the old covenant, and the new covenant and promises to Abraham and all this stuff that ties the Bible together and makes it really beautiful, by the way. But then you have this, verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Jesus holds his priesthood, the Greek term is operabiton, without successor, permanently. Permanently. Because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to do what? To make intercession for them. Please note, you can tell where someone's heart is when it comes to whether man's in charge of salvation or God's in charge of salvation. Because if they can look at verse 25, and if you're first, when, when I read verse 25, what do I see? He is able. The capacity and power of the Savior. Same thing you got in John chapter 6. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he's given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Christ is a powerful Savior who will not fail. But you know what I hear people do? They look at that and go, well, but it says those who draw near to God through him, I've got to draw near to God. They have to find some way of putting themselves in charge, even if it's in a descriptive phrase. He is able if you enable him. It's amazing what people will do. That's just a descriptive phrase of who it is that he's saving. Why does anyone, why does anyone draw near to God? Because the father drew him. That's the biblical teaching. But he is able to save to the uttermost. Why? Because he always lives to make intercession for them. Think with me for a moment, folks. I'm going to mess the cameras up here. I want you to think with me about Leviticus chapter 16. 
<laughs> and you're all going, oh no, I hope he doesn't ask me a question publicly about this. The Day of Atonements, we call it the Day of Atonement, but really when you look at it in, Le in Leviticus 16, it was the Day of Atonements, Yom Kippurim. And the priest would first offer sacrifice for himself, and then he's going to offer the sacrifice in behalf of the people. The picture with me, the tabernacle. Now you can do the temple too if you want, but the, the book of Hebrews likes to do the tabernacle. You have the sacrifice. You have drained the blood into a bowl. And the high priest is going to, it's one time during the year that the high priest is going to enter into the holy place. We call it the holy of holies, but if you read Hebrew, that just means the holiest place. The only time you go through the, through the veil, which was torn from top to bottom when Christ dies. He has to take that bowl. Have you ever thought about the fact that bowl would be warm? The lifeblood in that bowl, you could feel the heat. And he enters into the very presence of God. Now you look at the description of the holy place. There's no chairs. There's no place to sit, no place to rest. Instead, you have the mercy seat on the ark, symbolizing the very presence of God. And what's he to do? He is to sprinkle that blood as a covering on the mercy seat in behalf of the people. There's a substitution of the life of that animal in behalf of the people. But then what does he get to do? Does he get to put the bowl down and just, oh, it's wonderful in here. No. As soon as he does that, he backs out. He can't stay there. There's nothing about that blood that gives him access to stay in that place. Have you ever thought of this? There's nothing in scripture about cleaning the ark. So what did the high priest see? Let's say you've been high priest for many years. And you, it's, it's day of atonement again. You walk in. Are you going to see the dried blood from five years ago? 10 years ago. And what is that going to tell him? This must point to something greater. There must be something more. The repetitive nature of doing this over and over and over again, this must be pointing to something greater. And then he dies. And the next guy comes along and he's going to do it again and do it again and do it again. What does Jesus do? Well, according to this text, remember back in chapter six, Hebrews six, a lot of time people, all, all they think about is the apostasy passage. No. Look at what it says. Verse 19 we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We have a firm anchor that goes into the holy place because when Jesus goes in, he stays there. He stays there. He's at the right hand of the father. He is, as it says in chapter nine, he has obtained eternal redemption. Look at uh, verse, sorry, verse 23, chapter nine. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 
nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place each year, every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to have suffered repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But that as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as is appointed for men to die once. And after that comes judgment. So Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him once one time hopox for all time. And there's two ways in English. If, if when you say once for all time, Once, when you say once for all, you can understand that in two different ways. This is a temporal term. It's emphasizing the absolute singularity of the sacrifice of Christ and what it accomplishes. He has appeared once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself once, one time. Oh, I'm not sure if that emphasis is in the text. Well, follow me into chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices... There is a reminder of sins every year for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Think about it. You're a faithful follower of Yahweh and you have come to the temple. You're not a priest. You have come to the temple your entire life and you have seen a number of different high priests. They've performed the rituals. They performed the sacrifice. They've taken that blood and you've waited expectantly as he's in the holy place and then he comes out and a year later you do it again and a year later you do it again and the next year it's a different high priest over and over and over and the point of the scriptures is the blood of goats and calves cannot remove sin that's why it had to be repeated over and over again but now Tune in with me, tune in. But in these sacrifices, what sacrifices? The repetitive ones, the ones you do over and over and over and over again. But in these sacrifices, there is an anamnesis. Anamnesis. A reminder of sins every year. The old gives you a reminder that your sins have not been dealt with that you're looking to something beyond the blood of goats and calves. Your sin still needs to be dealt with. It's still there. There's something farther down the road. You must be looking toward in faith. And it's an anamnesis, a reminder. And part of the reason that God is so very clear in saying to the Jewish people, I'm tired of your sacrifices, is because they didn't care about their sin. They'd come and they'd bring their offerings and then they would go and they would treat their fellow Israelite in unjust fashions and they would commit fornications and they would, they would worship idols. He says, I'm tired of your sacrifices. Because there is supposed to be a reminder. It's supposed to cause them to spiritually realize. But they didn't. And so the writer of the Hebrews tells us repetitive sacrifices repeated over and over again are a anamnesis, a reminder of sins. Now, the term anamnesis doesn't appear very often in the New Testament, but it does appear one other place, well, a couple other places, but it's the same context. Jesus says about the supper, do this as an anamnesis of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Same term, anamnesis. You see the difference? Under the old, it's a reminder of what? 
sin under their new, it's a reminder of the sin bearer, Jesus. It's not a reminder of our sins because he has borne them in our place. He has taken them away. And that's why we have in chapter 10, look at verse 9. And then he added, I have, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first, the old, in order to establish the second, covenants. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Christ accomplishes it. Once for all sacrifice. No unbloody representation that only gives you partial grace. One sacrifice. Sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 14, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. He has done so, not us. His sacrifice, his work. That's the actual ground of justification by faith. We can talk about sola fide, but if you don't have that ground, you don't understand how it can be. How can it be? So we'll close this. Turn, turn with me, of course, to Romans chapter 4. You know, it used to be able to hear the pages turning, but now everyone's just tapping away. Tap, 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 tap. Romans chapter 4. How can a holy God... Because we know Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the peace. There's the Shalom. True shalom is a wellness of relationship. It's not just a ceasefire. If you can be at enmity with someone by the time you go to bed tonight, that's not shalom. That's not true peace. That's not true peace. And so he's going to get to, therefore, we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God. We have peace with God. True shalom, a proper relationship. How'd we get there though? Because I, I know my own sin. I know how many times I fail. Greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. None of us kept that today. So how, did God just simply wave his hand? No. No. 4-2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abram believed God. It was crowned to him as righteousness, credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. One of God's favorite Bible passages because it's quoted so often in the New Testament. Psalm 110, 1 is God's favorite Bible passage because he quotes it all the time. Abram believed God and it was credited to him, counted to him as righteousness. Now listen. Verses 4 and 5. And, and when I do a presentation of this and use digital stuff and things like that, I put this up there so you can see it. Verses 4 and 5 are meant to be placed like this. Because notice what it says. Now to the one who works, and then verse 5 starts, and to the one who does not work. It's the exact same Greek phrase except the word not is put in. So they're meant to be parallel so you can see exactly what they're saying. Now to the one who works, his wage is not counted as a gift but as what is due. He's using, uh, maybe you get paid on a Friday. So maybe a couple days ago, you went into work and there was that envelope in your inbox and there is that check. Now, I know most of it's done electronically anymore, but uh, run with me here. You get paid. You have put in your 40 hours and you've agreed to a certain wage. And so you get your paycheck. That's not a gift. If your boss comes up to you and says, here's a gift for you, you might be in trouble because <laughs> he probably doesn't think your work is really worth it. But no, it's not a gift. It's what's your due. So to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as, but as his due. But to the one who does not work, but does what? Believes in him who justifies the ungodly, declares righteous 
the ungodly, his faith is, the Greek term is like gizomai, to impute, to count, to reckon. His faith is reckoned as righteousness. Not his works, to one not working. This was so clear that even Joseph Smith got it. Yeah, Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism. He changed the verse in his inspired version. He could not believe what this text said. And so in the inspired version, it says, but believes in him who does not justify the ungodly. He turned the gospel on its head because he didn't understand grace. Didn't understand grace. But when you think about it for a second, how can God justify the ungodly? It says in the Old Testament over and over again to, 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 to call the ungodly righteous is wrong. Well, how can God do it and still be just? Well, here's the explanation. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Oh, okay, Paul. Paul's going to quote us some Old Testament texts where God counts someone as righteous apart from works, apart from what they've done. Well, that's interesting, Paul. Where are you going to get that from? Psalm 32. Hmm. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Covered. Blessed is the man against whom, or again, in the sense of condemnation, against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, is the literal rendering. Um, Paul, did you miss something? Because you, you, you were going to tell us about God counting someone righteous apart from works. And how does he define that? In the non-imputation of sin. The non-imputation of sin. Well, how can God not impute my sin to me? He imputed it to someone else. He imputed it to your sin bearer. You see how God can be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus? Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. How can God still be just? Because Jesus died. Because he died once. And it was perfect in and of itself. And so here's my question. You can watch. You can go online. Watch my debate with Peter Stravinskis. Again, two PhDs from Ivy League schools. Ordained priest. And I asked him about Romans 4.8. And this is what I would ask any Roman Catholic. Who is the blessed man? I looked at the text and I said, Brother Stravinskis. Who is the blessed man to whom the Lord will not impute sin? His first answer was Jesus. Think about that one a second. So the father doesn't hold Jesus' sin against him? Yeah. That's already demonstrated that he'd never thought about this before. In fact, he hadn't. That particular debate was amazing because... He spent most of his opening uh, time talking about how he had dialogued with Jimmy Swaggart, assuming that I held the same views as Jimmy Swaggart. He had never read anything, including my books on the subject of Roman Catholicism. I had read everything he had ever written on purgatory, made for a little bit of an unfair debate. But he had never thought about these issues before. And so I redirected the question. And his response was, well, I hope to be. I hope to be the blessed man. One other Roman Catholic, at least he was trying to struggle with it seriously, said, um, the blessed man is the person who has just been baptized in the church before he walks out the door and can possibly commit a sin. Okay. I hope you understand when you read Romans chapter 4. The blessed man of Romans 4, 8 is every single believer in Jesus Christ. 
And if you don't understand, and if your theology keeps you from being that blessed man, then you've got the wrong theology. And you're being kept from having peace with God. Because you see, in Roman Catholicism, if you commit a venial sin, is it imputed to you? Of course it is. If you commit a mortal sin, is it imputed to you? Of course it is. You have to deal with the temporal punishments and in even the eternal punishments when it comes to the mortal sins. There is no non-imputation of sin in Roman Catholicism. They have decided, Council of Trent decided, that that was a fiction and the process missed the very heart of the message, what the gospel is. Now, I'm very thankful that God is gracious and good. We haven't addressed this subject, but I'm, I'm, I need to before we close. Do I believe every Roman Catholic is going to hell? Of course not. Just like I don't believe every member of this church is going to heaven. One of the fastest places into hell is from the pews of a Baptist church. The name on the door doesn't save anybody. It's the message being preached and where your faith is. And is it possible that there are Roman Catholics who have true saving faith because they, they've heard the message and they believe? Yeah. But they're saved not because of the church but in spite of the church. It's not the church's message that they're believing in. And I've met them. Thanks be to God. So it's not, it's not walking in and out of that door that's going to determine where you're going. Are you the one working? Are you the one not working but believing? Are you the blessed man? Are you not the blessed man? Have you been perfected by the once for all sacrifice of Christ? Or you keep going back over and over and over and over again so that you can approach the cross of Christ 30,000 times in your life and still not be perfected. That's the difference. That's the issue. And so how can you have true shalom? You can only have true shalom when you realize that the righteousness in which you stand, the faith that you have exercised, when you have reached the hand of grace. You haven't put a bunch of stuff in it. Oh, can I give you some of this? I, you know, I just feel like I need to give you something. I know it's not enough, but, but you're never going to be able to grasp anything as long as you've got something in that hand. You have to empty the hand of faith, of any merit, of any work. That is the only hand that will fit into the hand of grace. That's the issue not the necessity of grace it's the sufficiency of grace the sufficiency of the cross the sufficiency of the once for all sacrifice now you're sitting a bunch of you are sitting there going well i get it but man if you think about it what you're saying is just as relevant to a whole bunch of protestants as it is to roman catholics mm -hmm. yeah true you've got to ask anybody what is your ultimate faith in when you woke up this morning why didn't you fear the wrath of god you know your own heart don't you you know the thoughts you've had the anger that you've had lust jealousy pride envy you know your heart and if you know the holiness of god why did you wake up not trembling in fear of God's wrath? The only answer has to be the righteousness before, by, by which I stand before him is not my own. It is that of Christ. And I will never be able to add anything to it. And the whole reason that I desire to be sanctified and to walk in good works and to glorify Christ is not to add to what he has done, but out of a pure love for the grace that has saved me. That's the issue. That's why we're here. And so I hope if you have opportunity, ask that question. Are you the blessed man? 
and if, if you get, yeah, yes, I am. Okay. Then, then ask the follow-up questions. So what about the sacramental system? What about the fact that you can approach the Eucharistic sacrifice over and over and over and over again? What about the, the very nature of sin? Because some will say, sure, they've never really thought through what's being said. But that's where we need to go. Can there be some stuff that gets in the way first? Yeah. Yeah. No, no two ways about it. Is it worth your time and effort to learn those things so as to be an efficient tool in the hand of your Savior? Sure is. Sure is. Let's pray together. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we, we come before you now and we recognize even in the quietness of this time that we can only come to the throne of grace because you bid us to come and you have made the way open. We come before your holy throne, not in fear, because you have provided us that sure anchor that goes into the veil. We have our substitute who pleads in your presence, and his sacrifice is perfect in our place. And so, Lord, we first of all ask that for all of us who have had the glorious, gracious opportunity of knowing what your word teaches and embracing that message of powerful, saving grace, Lord, that we would always be so thankful. And we would always, in all of our interactions with others, see ourselves as the redeemed. Not better than anyone else. There was nothing in us that drew that grace to us. Or that changes everything. But because of that, that we would pay the price, and sometimes there is a price to pay to speak these truths to those who have been given another way. A way that robs them of the peace that is found only in understanding the perfection of Christ's work and how we are to be united with him by faith. And so, Lord, I pray for those who have listened to all of these discussions, Lord, that you would cause them to remember Lord, that they would do the study necessary to make these things firm in their minds. And Lord, you'd give us many opportunities to speak the truth to all those around us with love and grace. We pray all these things in Christ's name.